Dry September by William Faulkner Through the bloody September twilight aftermath of sixty-two rainless days, it had gone like a fire in dry grass, the rumor, the story, whatever it was, something about Miss Minnie Cooper and a negro, attacked, insulted, frightened, none of them gathered in the barber shop on that saturday evening where the ceiling fan stirred without freshening it the vitiated air sending back upon him in recurrent surges of stale pomade and lotion their own stale breath and odors knew exactly what had happened except it wasn't will mays a barber said he was a man of middle age a thin sand-colored man with a mild face who was shaving a client i know will mays He's a good nigger, and I know Miss Minnie Cooper, too. What do you know about her? A second barber said. Who is she? The client said. A young girl? No, the barber said. She's about forty, I reckon. She ain't married, that's why I don't believe. Believe hell! A hulking youth in a sweat-stained silk shirt said. Won't you take a white woman's word for a niggers? I don't believe Will Mays did it, the barber said. I know Will Mays. Maybe you know who did it, then. Maybe you already got him out of town, you damn nigger lover. I don't believe anybody did anything. I don't believe anything happened. I'll leave it to you fellows if them ladies that get old without getting married don't have notions that a man can't. Then you are a hell of a white man, the client said. He moved under the cloth. The youth had sprung to his feet. You don't, he said. Do you accuse a white woman of lying? The barber held the razor poised above the halfers and client. He did not look around. It's this dern weather, another said. It's enough to make a man do anything, even to her. Nobody laughed, the barber said in his mild, stubborn tone. I ain't accusing nobody of nothing. I just know, and you fellows know how one woman that never. You damn nigger lover, the youth said. Shut up, butch, another said. We'll get the facts and plenty of time to act. Who is? Who's getting them? The youth said. Facts hail. You're a fine white man, Klein said, ain't you? In his frothy beard, he looked like a desert rat in the moving pictures. You tell him, Jack, he said to the youth. If there ain't any white men in this town, you can count on me, even if I ain't only a drummer and a stranger. That's right, boys, the barber said. Find out the truth first. I know Will Mays. Well, by God! The youth shouted, to think that a white man in this town. Shut up, Butch, the second speaker said. We got plenty of time. The client sat up. He looked at the speaker. Do you claim that anything excuses a nigger attacking a white woman? Do you mean to tell me you are a white man and you'll stand for it? You better go back to north where you came from. The south don't want your kind here. North what? The second said, I was born and raised in this town. Well, by God, the youth said. He looked about with a strained, baffled gaze, as if he was trying to remember what it was he wanted to say or do. He drew his sleeve across his sweating face. Damn, if I'm going to let a white woman... You tell him, Jack, the drummer said. By God, if they... The screen door crashed open. A man stood in the floor, his feet apart, and his heavy set body poised easily. His white shirt was open at the throat. He wore a felt hat. His hot, bold glance swept the group. His name was McClendon. He had commanded troops at the front in France and had been decorated for valor. Well, he said, are you going to sit there and let a black son rape a white woman on the streets of Jefferson? Butch sprang up again. The silk of his shirt clung flat to his heavy shoulders. At each armpit was a dark half-moon. That's what I've been telling him! That's what I... Did it really happen? A third said. This ain't the first man scare she ever had, like Hawkshaw says. Wasn't there something about a man on the kitchen roof watching her undress about a year ago? What? The client said. What's that? The barber had been slowly forcing him back down into the chair. He arrested himself reclining, his head lifted, the barber still pressing him down. McClendon whirled on the third speaker. Happen? What the hell difference does it make? Are you going to let the black sons get away with it until one really does it? That's what I'm telling them, Butch shouted. He cursed, long and steady, pointless. Hear, hear, a force said. Not so loud. Don't talk so loud. Sure, 
McClinton said. No talking necessary at all. I've done my talking. Who's with me? He poised on the balls of his feet, roving his gaze. The barber held the drummer's face down, the razor poised. Found out the facts first, boys. I know Willie Mays. It wasn't him. Let's get the sheriff and do this thing right. McClendon whirled upon him, his furious, rigid face. The barber did not look away. They looked like men of different races. The other barbers had ceased also above their prone clients. You mean to tell me, McClendon said, that you'd take a nigger's word before a white woman's? Why, you damn nigger lovin'. The third speaker rose and grasped McClendon's arm. He too had been a soldier. Now, now, let's figure this thing out. Who knows anything about what really happened? Figure out hell, McClendon jerked his arm free. All that are with me, get up from there, the ones that ain't. He roved his gaze, dragging his sleeve across his face. Three men rose, the drummer in the chair sat up. Here, he said, jerking at the cloth about his neck. Get this rag off me, I'm with him. I don't live here, but by God, if our mothers and wives and sisters... He smeared the cloth over his face and flung it to the floor. McClendon stood in the door and cursed the others. Another rose and moved toward him. The remainder sat uncomfortable, not looking at one another. Then, one by one, they rose and joined him. The barber picked the cloth from the floor. He began to fold it neatly. Boys, don't do that. Will May's never done it, I know. Come on, McClendon said. He whirled. From his hip pocket protruded the butt of a heavy automatic pistol. They went out. The screen door crashed behind them, reverberant in the dead air. The barber wiped the razor carefully and swiftly and put it away and ran to the rear and took his hat from the wall. I'll be back as soon as I can, he said to the barbers. I can't let... He went out, running. The two other barbers followed him to the door and caught it on the rebound, leaning out and looking up the street after him. The air was flat and dead. It had a metallic taste at the base of the tongue. What can he do? The first said. The second one was saying, Jeez Christ, Jeez Christ, under his breath. I'd just as left be Will and Mays' hawk if he gets McClendon riled. Jeez Christ, Jeez Christ, the second whispered. You reckon he really done it to her? The first said. Two. She was thirty-eight or thirty-nine. She lived in a small frame house with her invalid mother and a thin, sallow, unflagging aunt where each morning between ten and eleven she would appear on the porch in a lace-trimmed boudoir cap to sit swinging in the porch swing until noon. After dinner she lay down for a while until the afternoon began to cool. Then in one of the three or four new wall dresses which she had each summer, she would go downtown to spend the afternoon in the stores with the other ladies, where they would handle the goods and haggle over the prices in cold, immediate voices without any intention of buying. She was of comfortable people, not the best in Jefferson, but good people enough, and she was still on the slender side of ordinary looking, with a bright, faintly haggard manner and dress. When she was young, she had had a slender, nervous body and a sort of hard vivacity which had enabled her for a time to ride upon the crest of the town's social life, as exemplified by the high school party and church social period of her contemporaries, while still children enough to be unclass conscious. She was the last to realize that she was losing ground, that those among whom she had been a little brighter and louder flame than any other were beginning to learn the pleasure of snobbery male and retaliation female. That was when her face began to wear that bright, haggard look. She still carried it to parties on shadowy porticos and summer lawns, like a mask or a flag, with that bafflement of furious repudiation of truth in her eyes. One evening at a party, she heard a boy and two girls, all schoolmates, talking. She never accepted another invitation. She watched the girls with whom she had grown up as they married and got homes and children, but no man ever called on her steadily until the children of the other girls had been calling her Auntie for several years, the while their mothers told them in bright voices about how popular Aunt Minnie had been as a girl. Then the town began to see her driving on Sunday afternoons with a cashier in the bank. He was a widower about forty, a high-colored man smelling always faintly of the barber shop or of whiskey. He owned the first automobile in town, a red runabout. Minnie had the first motoring bonnet and veil the town ever saw. Then the town began to say, Poor Minnie, but she is old enough to take care of herself. 
mother said. That was when she began to ask her old schoolmates that their children call her cousin instead of auntie. It was twelve years now since she had been relegated into adultery by public opinion, and eight years since a cashier had gone to a Memphis bank, returning for one day each Christmas, which he spent at an annual bachelor's party at a hunting club on the river. From behind their curtains, the neighbors would see the party pass, and during the over-the-way Christmas Day visiting, they would tell her about him, about how well he looked, and how they heard that he was prospering in the city, watching with bright, secret eyes her haggard, bright face. Usually, by that hour, there would be the scent of whiskey on her breath. It was supplied her by a youth, the clerk at the Soden Fountain. Sure, I buy it for the old gal. I reckon she's entitled to a little fun. Her mother kept to her room altogether now. The gaunt aunt ran the house. Against that background, Minnie's bright dresses, her idle and empty days, had a quality of furious unreality. She went out in the evenings only with women now, neighbors, to the moving pictures. Each afternoon, she dressed in one of the new dresses and went downtown alone, where her young cousins were already strolling in the late afternoons with their delicate silken heads and thin, awkward arms and conscious hips, clinging to one another or shrieking and giggling with paired boys in the soda fountain when she passed and went on along the serried storefronts, in the doors of which the sitting and lounging men did not even follow her with their eyes any more. 3. The barber went swiftly up the street where the sparse lights insects swirled, glared in rigid and violent suspension in the lifeless air. The day had died in a pall of dust. Above the darkened square, shrouded by the spent dust, the sky was as clear as the inside of a brass bell. Below the east was a rumor of the twice-waxed moon. When he overtook them, McClendon and three others were getting into a car packed in an alley. McClendon stooped his thick head, peering out beneath the top. Change your mind, did you? He said. Damn good thing. By God, tomorrow when this town hears about how you talk tonight. Now, now, the other ex-soldier said. Hawkshaw's all right. Come on, Hawk. Jump in. Well, May's never done it, boys, the barber said. If anybody done it... Well, you all know well as I do, there ain't any town where they got better niggers than us. And you know how a lady will kind of think things about men when there ain't any reason to, and Miss Minnie anyway. Sure, sure, the soldier said. We're just going to talk to him a little, that's all. Talk hell, Butch said, when we're through with the... Shut up, for God's sake, the soldier said. Do you want everybody in town? Tell them, by God, McClendon said. Tell every one of the sons that'll let a white woman. Let's go, let's go. Here's the other car. The second car slid, squealing out of a cloud of dust at the alley mouth. McClendon started his car and took the lead. Dust lay like fog in the street. The street's lights hung, nimbused as in water. They drove on out of town. A rutted lane turned at right angles, dust hung above it too, and above all the land. The dark bulk of the ice plant, where the negro maze was the night watchman, rose against the sky. Better stop here, hadn't we? the soldier said. McClendon did not reply. He hurled the car up and slammed to a stop, the headlights glaring on the blank wall. Listen here, boys, the barber said. If he's here, don't that prove he never done it, don't it? If it was him, he would run. Don't you see he would? The second car came up and stopped. McClendon got down. Butch sprang down beside him. Listen, boys, the barber said. Cut the lights off, McClendon said. The breathless dark rushed down. There was no sounds in it save their lungs as they sought air in the parched dust in which for two months they had lived. Then the diminishing crunch of McClendon's and Dutch's feet, and a moment later McClendon's voice. Will! Will! Below the east, the wan hemorrhage of the moon increased. It heaved above the ridge, silvering the air, the dust, so that they seemed to breathe, live in a bowl of molten lead. There was no sound of night bird nor insect, no sound save their breathing and a faint ticking of contracting metals about the cars. Where their bodies touched one another, they seemed to sweat dryly, for no more moisture came. Christ, a voice said, let's get out of here. But they didn't move until vague noises began to grow out of the darkness ahead. Then they got out and waited tensely in the breathless dark. 
There was another sound, a blow, a hissing expulsion of breath, and McClendon cursing in an undertone. They stood a moment longer, then they ran forward. They ran in a stumbling clump as though they were fleeing someone. Kill him! Kill the son! A voice whispered. McClendon flung them back. Not here, he said. Get him into the car. Kill him! Kill the black son! The voice murmured. They dragged the negro to the car. The barber had waited beside the car. He could feel himself sweating, and he knew he was going to be sick at the stomach. "'What is it, Captains?' the negro said. "'I ain't done nothing. Told God, Mr. John.' Someone produced handcuffs. They worked busily about the negro as though he were a post, quiet and tent, getting in one another's way. He submitted to the handcuffs, looking swiftly and constantly from dim face to dim face. "'Who's here, Captains?' he said, leaning to appear into the faces until they could feel his breath and smell his sweaty reek. He spoke a name or two. What you all say I done, Mr. John? McClendon jerked the car door open. Get in, he said. The negro did not move. What you all going to do with me, Mr. John? I ain't done nothing. White folks, captains, I ain't done nothing. I swear for God, he called another name. Get in, McClendon said. He struck the negro. The others expelled their breath in a dry hissing and struck him with random blows, and he whirled and cursed them and swept his manacled hands across their faces and slashed the barber upon the mouth, and the barber struck him also. Get him in there, McClendon said. They pushed at him. He ceased struggling and got in and sat quietly as the others took their places. He sat between the barber and the soldier, drawing his limbs in so as not to touch them, his eyes going swiftly and constantly from face to face. Butch clung to the running board. The car moved on. The barber nursed his mouth with his handkerchief. "'What's the matter, Hawk?' the soldier said. "'Nothing,' the barber said. They regained the high road and turned away from town. The second car dropped back out of the dust. They went on, gaining speed. The final fringe of houses dropped behind. God damn, he stinks, the soldier said. We'll fix that, the drummer in front beside McClendon said. On the running board, Butch cursed into the hot rush of air. The barber leaned suddenly forward and touched McClendon's arm. Let me out, John, he said. Jump out, nigger lover. McClendon said without turning his head. He drove swiftly. Behind them, the sourceless lights of the second car glared in the dust. Presently, McClendon turned into a narrow road. It was rutted with disuse. It led back to an abandoned brick kiln, a series of reddish mound and weed and vine-choked vats without bottom. It had been used for pasture once, until one day the owner missed one of his mules. Although he prodded carefully in the vats with a long pool, he could not even find the bottoms of them. John, the barber said. Jump out then, McClendon said, hurling the car along the ruts. Beside the barber, the negro spoke. Mr. Henry? The barber sat forward. The narrow tunnel of the road rushed up and passed. Their motion was like an extinct furnace blast, cooler but utterly dead. The car bounded from rut to rut. Mr. Henry? The negro said. The barber began to tug furiously at the door. Look out there! the soldier said, but the barber had already kicked the door open and swung onto the running road. The soldier leaned across the negro and grasped at him, but he had already jumped. The car went on without checking speed. The impetus hurled him crashing through the dust sheath, wheezed into the ditch. Dust puffed about him, and in a thin, vicious crackling of sapless stems, he lay choking and retching until the second car passed and died away. Then he rose and limped on until he reached the high road and turned towards town, brushing at his clothes with his hands. The moon was higher, riding high and clear of the dust at last, and after a while the town began to glare beneath the dust. He went on, limping. Presently he heard cars, and the glow of them grew in the dust behind him, and he left the road and crashed again in the weeds until they passed. McClendon's car came last now. There were four people in it, and Butch was not on the running board. They went on. The dust swallowed them, and the glare and the sound died away. The dust of them hung for a while, but soon the eternal dust absorbed it again. The barber climbed back under the road and limped on toward town. 4. As she dressed for supper on that Saturday evening, her own flesh felt like fever. Her hands trembled among the hooks and eyes, and her eyes had a feverish look, and her hair swirled crisped and crackling under the comb.
While she was still dressing, the friends called for her and sat while she donned her sheerest underthings and stockings and a new vol dress. Do you feel strong enough to go out? They said, their eyes bright too with a dark glitter. When you have had time to get over the shock, you must tell us what happened, what he said and did, everything. In the leaf darkness, as they walked toward the square, she began to breathe deeply, something like a swimmer preparing to dive until she ceased trembling, the four of them walking slowly because of the terrible heat and out of solicitude for her. But as they neared the square, she began to tremble again, walking with her head up, her hands clenched at her sides, their voices about her murmurous, also with that feverish, glittering quality of their eyes. They entered the square, she in the center of the group, fragile in her fresh dress. She was trembling worse. She walked slower and slower as children eat ice cream, her head up and her eyes bright in the haggard banner of her face, passing the hotel and the coatless drummers and chairs along the curb looking around her. That's the one. See? The one in pink in the middle. Is that her? What did they do with the nigger? Did they? Sure, he's all right. All right, is he? Sure, he went on a little trip. Then the drug store, where even the young men lounging in the doorway tipped their hats and followed with their eyes the motion of her hips and legs when she passed. They went on, passing the lifted hats of the gentlemen, the suddenly ceased voices different, protective. Do you see? The friends said. Their voices sounded like long, hovering sighs of hissing exultation. There's not a negro on the square. Not one. They reached the picture show. It was like a miniature fairyland with its lighted lobby and colored lithographs of life caught in its terrible and beautiful mutations. Her lips began to tingle. In the dark, when the picture began, it would be all right. She could hold back the laughing so it would not waste away so fast and so soon. So she hurried on before the turning faces, the undertones of low astonishment, and they took their accustomed places where she could see the aisle against the silver glare and the young men and girls coming in two and two against it. The lights flicked away. The screen glowed silver, and soon life would begin to unfold, beautiful and passionate and sad, while still the young men and girls entered, scented and sibilant in the half-dark, their paired backs in silhouette delicate and sleek, their slim, quick bodies awkward, divinely young, while beyond them the silver dream accumulated, inevitably, on and on. She began to laugh, and trying to suppress it, it made more noise than ever. Heads began to turn. Still laughing, her friends raised her and let her out, and she stood at the curb, laughing on a high, sustained note until the taxi came up and they helped her in. They removed the pink wool and the sheer underthings and the stockings and put her to bed and cracked ice for her temples and sent for a doctor. He was hard to locate, so they ministered to her with hushed ejaculations, renewing the ice and fanning her. While the ice was fresh and cold, she stopped laughing and lay still for a time, moaning only a little. But soon the laughing welled again, and her voice rose screaming, Shh! Shh! They said, freshening the ice pack, smoothing her hair, examining it for gray. Poor girl! Then to one another, Do you suppose anything really happened? Their eyes darkly aglitter, secret and passionate. Shh! Poor girl! Poor Minnie! Five. It was midnight when McClendon drove up to his neat new house. It was trim and fresh as a birdcage and almost as small, with its clean green and white paint. He locked the car and mounted the porch and entered. His wife rose from a chair beside the reading lamp. McClendon stopped in the floor and stared at her until she looked down. Look at that clock, he said, lifting his arm, pointing. She stood before him, her face lowered, a magazine in her hands. Her face was pale, strained, and weary-looking. Have I not told you about sitting up like this, waiting to see when I come in? John, she said. She laid the magazine down, poised on the balls of his feet. He glared at her with his hot eyes, his sweating face. Didn't I tell you? He went toward her. She looked up then. He caught her shoulder. She stood passive, looking at him. No, John. I couldn't sleep. The heat. Something. Please, John, you're hurting me. Didn't I tell you? He released her and half struck, half flung her across the chair, and she lay there and watched him quietly as he left the room. He went on through the house, ripping off his shirt, and on the dark, screened porch at the rear, he stood and mopped his head and shoulders with a shirt and flung it away. 
He took the pistol from his hip and laid it on the table beside the bed, and sat on the bed and removed his shoes, and rose and slipped his trousers off. He was sweating again already, and he stooped and hunted furiously for the shirt. At last he found it and wiped his body again, and, with his body pressed against the dusty screen, he stood, panting. There was no movement, no sound, not even an insect. The dark world seemed to lie stricken beneath the cold moon and the lidless stars.